Thank you, Sister Blake, for that song. A reminder that we all need to be faithful. Faithful. We need to be faithful because Jesus is coming soon. And your brother's name is Winston? Dwayne. 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 Welcome, Dwayne. Pleasure. And uh, thank you, Elder Soraldi, for the opportunity to preach here this morning and, um, and to share a word with you all. So I just want to let you know what's happening. I just want to thank the Sebring Church for allowing us to use your fellowship hall for our brunches. We will be having our next remnant brunch on the 24th. Now, some of you are thinking, what's a remnant brunch? You're thinking that. I can tell by the puzzled looks in your eyes. I can tell. A remnant brunch is where people just come together and, and they really are end time focused and they are there to um, learn some skills, to find out what's going on, to encourage each other, and to share a brunch meal together. We'll be learning some vital skills which will be important in the end time. So that's our remnant brunch. It, it starts at 11 and we finish around 2 o'clock. So it's, it's, and we'll be having it here in Sebring Church. Well, not in the church, in the fellowship hall. So you're, you're invited to attend. We will also want you to know that we have a cat meeting, an end time preparation cat meeting. It's exactly as the title says. It's an end time preparation cat meeting. When I mean cat meeting, yes, we are intense. We're intense. Some bring their RVs. <laughs> But a lot of us stay intense, and, or some commuting every day. But a lot of us are intent. And the focus is worshiping together, fellowshipping together, learning vital skills, which are important for your individual preparation for the second coming of Jesus Christ, whether that's spiritual preparation, whether that's physical, emotional, uh, or mental preparation. We are there to help you uh, prepare for Jesus Christ's second coming. Isn't that why we come to church? If there's any other reason why you come to church, you shouldn't really come to church. Jesus Christ and his second coming is the most important thing. And finally, you know, I'm on sabbatical. I've been on sabbatical since the 1st of May, and it ends July the 31st. Oh. <laughs> and um, during my time, we've been working on um, this new website. It's called the wilderness survival camp.com and on it is all information that we are about the various pro, um, camp meetings that we have around the country and now even abroad and um, also information about the remnant branch. So this end time camp meeting we started here in Florida and it's gone to Georgia, Oklahoma. We'll be taking it to Alabama, Texas, uh, Virginia, Michigan, working on upstate New York, and another state here, Montana. Also, we will be taking it to England, working on Scotland as well. So there is an awakening happening around the world. People are realizing something, that Jesus Christ is coming soon. He's coming soon. That's exciting news. That's why we're Adventists, because Jesus Christ is coming soon. Let us pray. Our Father God, we want to thank you, dear Lord, for the opportunity to share a word together. We come with empty cups. Regardless of how our week has been, we need you now. Because what lies ahead of us is far more daunting than what, has, what we've gone through already. So we need a word from you. So dear Lord, help all of us to ignore this audible voice and listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Because we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, I'm going to move around. Okay, so Mrs. White says this um, in, the, in the book, uh, Testimony Volume 5. It is not in the order of God that light has been 
kept from our people. Mm. The very present truth which they needed for this time. So what, what is Mrs. White saying? She's saying that in a particular situation, particular circumstance to which she was writing, that precious, important, present truth, light, was kept from the people of God. Now that's a serious accusation. Because we need this light. We need this present truth. So my sermon today is all about what is this present truth that we need? What is this present truth that we need? So what is present truth? The phrase present truth only appears once in the Bible. And it's in our scripture reading, ably read by little joy. And it says this, wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. Though he know them and be established in the present truth. So in Peter's time, to the people he was writing, there was a present truth. This is the only reference in the Bible. And it doesn't really tell us what this present truth is. We are actually none the wiser from this biblical reference to it. So let's dig a little deeper. So what it is truth. Anybody can tell me what is truth from the Bible? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Any other Bible verses? Thy word is truth. Psalms 119. Any other references? The law is truth. Any other references? Okay, the truth will set us free. So let's look at these things. First of all, Deuteronomy 32 verse 4. And if you have a pen and paper, you should be writing these things down because you're going to need it to defend yourself in the end times, okay? Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are, are judgment. A God of truth. And without iniquity, just and right is he. So from this text, what can we deduce? That God is truth. Amen? Oh, my bad. Amen? Okay. So go, the first thing we need to learn from Deuteronomy is that God is truth. Second thing, John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy, thy word is truth. And when the Bible is referring to the word, what is it referring to? The law and all the whole of the written scriptures in this situation, the whole of the written scripture, that is truth. Okay? So the second thing is the word, the Bible, is truth. And that's important to us because we base our belief system on the word, on the Bible, because we take it to be true, to be true. Third thing, Psalms 119, verse 142 Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. So from that one, we can deduce that the law, more specifically, we had the word. Now it's the law is truth. The law is truth. The fourth one of Psalms 119 verse 151 says this. Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are truth. So not just all the written law, the books of Moses, but the commandments are truth as well. Psalms 119 verse 151. That's number four. So we've got God is truth. The word is truth. The law is truth. And now we've got the commandments are truth. There's one more, one more. Okay. And it's this in John chapter 14. Jesus says what? I am the, the, and the, I am the way, the truth, and light. Jesus is truth. In fact, if you think about it carefully, Jesus applies to all of the four we pre that preceded them. Because the law and the commandments are a reflection of God's character. And Jesus is God. 
And we know from the first one that God is truth. So Jesus is truth because Jesus is God. Okay? So Jesus is truth. Is that accurate to say? Jesus is the truth. So let's look at the word present. What does present mean? Not a gift. Not a gift. (laughs) Not a gift. Not a gift. Okay, you can be present. So when you're at school and the teacher took your register, back in the day they took registers, and you, they called out highs, and you would say present. How many of you remember that? Yeah, okay. Is this, a t- is this what it's talking about in this situation? Even though that's an accurate definition, no, we're actually looking at this, this one here. Existing or occurring now. Existing or occurring now. So, Jesus is the truth. And we're talking about the truth as it applies to now. So, my question is this. Where is Jesus right now? You sorry? In the holies of holies. Not just in the sanctuary. Okay. Okay. He's in the holy of holies interceding on our behalf in the most holy place, which he entered when? 1844. Come on, class. Remember, we're Adventists. We should know these things. Okay. So is this truth? Is, sorry, not is this truth, because it is truth. Is this present truth? Okay. Okay. Don't answer. Let's go a little bit further, okay? So let's look at some examples of present truth preachers in the Bible. And let's learn from them what they took as present truth and then apply it to the question about Jesus in the holies of holies. First of all, there's Noah, okay? Was Noah a present truth preacher? What was he preaching about? A flood. When was that flood going to occur? In the future. It was the next major thing that was going to happen. Correct? Okay. He wasn't saying the rain is coming down now. I'm preaching about rain that's falling now. He's just saying, no, in the future, rain is going to fall so much so that it's going to flood the whole earth. And even though you, your scientists can't compute or calculate it, It's going to happen because God told me it's going to happen. So he was talking about what was coming next or what what God was going to do next. Okay? Let's look at another present true preacher. Lot. I have some issues with Lot, okay? But the Bible does describe him as a preacher of righteousness, okay? And when he was running around the city, what was he preaching? When he was running around that city, that one night he was preaching in that city. That Sodom was going to be destroyed. He was telling his family and friends, get out. Come with us. Get out. Fire is going to come down. God has come to to destroy the city. So what was the message? He was talking about what was coming next. What God was going to do next. And what God was going to do in his day is destroy Sodom. Gomorrah, and all the cities of the plain. Then there was Jeremiah, a little bit harder, Jeremiah the prophet. Is he a present truth preacher? Just say yes. Just say yes. Okay, he's a present truth preacher, okay? And in his time, talking about Judah, because he was a prophet to Judah, he was preaching at the end of of almost, almost at the um, time of the exile, and his, his preaching would go over into the exile, okay? So what was, his, what was his message? His message was this, that the Babylonians are going to come. The Babylonians are going to come and destroy Jerusalem, and you all are going to be taken captive and taken off to Babylon, where you will be for 70 years. And their precious temple would be destroyed. Never happened before. But he's saying, this is what's coming next. This is what God is going to do next. 
You hear me? Present truth preacher. Then there's Jonah. Was he a present truth preacher? Yeah, he was a bit reluctant. Okay, yeah, I take that. He was a bit reluctant. But he preached a message in Nineveh. And what was his message in Nineveh? 40 days. And then the Lord is going to rain down judgment. Then 39 days. And the Lord is going to rain down judgment. It took him three days to walk up and down the city, telling, telling everybody, God is going to rain down judgment on the city. The message... Even though the people believed and accepted the message and repented and changed their mind, the present truth message was still the same. The present truth message is this. God, this is what God is going to do next. This is what God is going to do next. Then there's William Miller. He's not in the Bible. But he's a present truth preacher. Isn't he? Yes, he is. He's a present true preacher. And his message was what? Jesus is coming, 1844. He said, Jesus, well, 1843 started off. Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. And a, and a revival took over North America, okay? Because he was a present true preacher. Now, his message was this. This is what God is going to do next. This is what God is going to do next. Okay, so what present truth is this? Present truth is what is God going to do next? What's his next move? What's his next step? Because we know this from Amos chapter 3 verse 7. Surely the Lord will, sorry, surely the Lord God will do nothing. But he revealeth his secrets unto his servants, the prophet. That means God isn't going to surprise us and just drop something on us without first warning us. God is going to warn us, give us some clues, say this is what I'm going to do so that we are ready and prepared for it. He always tells us what he's going to do next. So, Let's get back to this question. This is not present truth. Ooh. I let that sink in. I let that sink in. Because this is what God is doing now. This is what God is doing now. Right now. He's in the holies of holies. Right now, he's interceding for us. Right now, judgment is going on. But what the question is, what is the, his next step? What is his next step? The next step is he takes off his robes, of, his priestly robes, put on his war robes, and comes out and comes to get us. That is present truth. That is present truth. So this is not present truth. Studying the papacy and finding out what the Pope is doing and all of that, even though that has a bearing, it's not telling us what God is doing next. This, the, this is the, I was trying to get a picture of the evangelical church or apostate Protestantism, okay? And their abomination and how they're taking Babylon into the world, into their church services. And it's turning from worship service into rock concerts. Yeah, yeah. This is not present truth. Even though we know that Catholicism, Protestantism will stretch across the gap and grasp the hand of Catholicism. We, this is not present truth. Even though it has a bearing. Even though it has a bearing. Um, what's happening in America and the political shenanigans that's going on between the various parties and, and so forth and, and how America is a lamb-like beast, even though that's biblical and even though that's important, it is not present truth. It's not present truth because it's not telling us what God is going to do next. The World Economic Forum, if you don't know about this, Ooh, we got a lot to talk about, okay? The World Economic Forum and all that Klaus Schwab <laughs> is doing to enslave the world, okay? How many of you do not know about the World Economic Forum? Okay, you don't know? You know 
is okay, so you know, we could talk about that at some stage because it's, it's, it's amazing what these unelected officials are trying to do to enslave the humanity. Okay? Anyway, even though that's incredibly important, incredibly interesting, and fascinating, and scary at the same time, this is not present truth. The threat of World War Three, all of these things, not present truth. But this is present truth. That Jesus Christ is going to cease his intercession for us. That is present truth. That is what we need to be focused on. That one day, God will say, enough is enough. So, the question, you know, th- there's lots of truths we have. You know, we believe that it's true that God created the world in six literal days. Amen? It's true. We know that's true. It's true that this divine God stripped off huma- stripped off divinity, took on humanity, and l- walked among us in the form of Jesus Christ. It's, that's true, isn't it? But it's not present truth. Okay? It's true that this... <laughs> This divine being um, who became hum- human died a, a, a shameful death on a cross and then rose after three days. That's true, isn't it? But it's not present truth. It's not present truth. And it's true that that divine being left this earth, went back to heaven, promising to return. That's true, isn't it? But it's not present truth. There's lots of things that are true, which are not present true. And this is why the devil is so smart. The devil can feed us truth all day long. Week after week after week. But he doesn't want us studying present truth. Because present truth will save you by preparing you. Will save you by preparing you. So he said, okay, yeah, you guys keep on studying creation. Keep on studying all these wonderful stuff. Keep on going. Keep on reading it. Wonderful stuff. Wonderful stuff. As long as he keeps you away from present truth, that Jesus Christ is going to end being our intercessor for us. So Mrs. White says this, this in early writings. There are many Precious truths contained within the word of God. How many? Many. It's filled with them. But it, it, but it is present truth that the flock needs now. Amen? It's present truth. We, you know, we've heard lots of these wonderful truth measures, wonderful truth measures. How to live a better life, how to manage your money, you know, and how, you know, re- re- sermons about relationships and all these wonderful stuff. It's true. But it's not present truth. And what w- the flock, and y- you all are the flock. We all are the flock. What we need now is present truth. It's present truth. R.F. Cottrell, one of our Adventist pioneers, says this. There is a present truth, 2 Peter 1, verse 12, for the present time. A present truth for the present time. The present truth is that God is now moving out a message, um, message in the three angels' message, by which to restore his downtrodden truth to all the remnant of his flock in order to prepare them for translation. Why is, why, is this, why is this present truth message going out? To prepare us for translation into his everlasting kingdom at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is near even at the door. So what, from what I'm gathering this, if you don't have this present truth, you will not be prepared for translation. Or it's going to hinder you g- being prepared for translation. This present truth aids you and assist you in your preparation for translation. For, some of, for those of you who do not know what translation is, it's the moment you leave this earth without dying. It's the moment when Jesus Christ comes, you've made it all 
all the way through uh, the great time of trouble and you see Jesus Christ come with your own eyes and then you're caught up to meet him in the air and you do not taste death. That's a select group. <laughs> it's not everybody gets to miss out on death. Except for the 144,000. Okay. The midnight cry in the parable of the virgins. The five wise and the five foolish. This is an illustration, a hint at the, the present truth. The present truth for their time was the bridegroom cometh. That was a, that was a message. That was a message. And that was present truth. And they got up. And they got ready. Some were prepared to get ready and able to get ready because they had oil. They had the spirit. And some were not. Some had been allowing the spirit to work in their lives and had experienced character transformation. The others had not. But the cry still went out. The bridegroom cometh. And when they heard it, they said, this is present truth. This is something I need to act on now. I can't just sit down and wait for, okay, he's going to come. He's going to come. I need to do something now. And they got up and got ready. So, this close of probation is what we have to think about and focus on because that's what's is going to impact us next. When Jesus steps out of the holy of holies, probation is closed. Probation is closed. That's what we have to focus on next. Revelation 22 verse 11 says this. He that is unjust, <laughs> let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy, filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, that means everybody's situation is set. Characters are formed. There's no change now. There are, there's a group of Adventists who believe that when they hear the Sunday law, oh, the Sunday law is passed, that they're going to just get up. I said, okay, I want to get ready now. The sad thing is they spent a lifetime rejecting the Holy Spirit. They spent a lifetime not listening to the Holy Spirit. And their characters have been formed like that. And it's going to be nigh on impossible for them to get ready at the last minute. The work to get ready occurs now. <laughs> You've got to be working on your character now. Ellen G. White says this, when Jesus ceases to plead for man, the cases of all are forever decided. This is the time of reckoning with his servants to those who have neglected the preparation of purity and holiness which fits them or prepares them to be waiting ones to welcome their Lord. The sun sets in gloom and darkness and rises not again. Probation closes. Christ's intercession ceases. Cease in heaven. That's some serious stuff. Serious stuff that we have to take on board and live with this reality is that we are expecting Christ to do that next. God's next step is to close the door of probation. God's next step is to cease working in the heavenly sanctuary. Mrs. White goes on in, to, in um, last day events. God keeps a record with the nations. Wow. So it's not just individuals. Not just individuals who probations 
closes. God keeps a record with the nations. The figures are swelling against them in the books of heaven. And when it shall have become a law that the transgression of the first day of the week shall be met with punishment, then their cup will be full. This is talking about the time when not just America, but nations around the world will enforce Sunday worship. For some people, even some Adventist theologians, they say that this is impossible. They say that this is impossible. Some Adventist theologians who teach in our institutions say that this is impossible. I rather believe Mrs. White than a human theologian. She says, under inspiration of God, that the nations around the world will do it. And when they do it, their cup have reached its limit. That means their probation is closed as a nation. Probation will close on America, on the United Kingdom, on the islands of the Caribbean, on the Philippines, the nation, all the nations of the world, their probation will close because they will enforce this. So there will be a death decree which will go out, which will say, if you do not worship on this particular day, Sunday, we will kill you on such and such a date. You've got this time to comply. But and after that time, if you're not complying, the vigilantes, the mobs, the police, the soldiers, the National Guard, your next door neighbor, the woman in the shop who serves you cookies, they will come to kill you. And it'll be lawful to do it. The death decree. When the death decree is passed, Probation for that nation closes. Daniel 12 verse 1 says this, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble. A time of trouble. Such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. The book of life. There's going to be a time of trouble. Unparalleled. You know what? When there was persecution in Europe, you know what they did? They ran to America. When there's persecution in certain parts of the world, like when there's persecution in, um, in Burma, they'll run across the border and go someplace where there isn't persecution. But in the last days, there is no place to run. No place to run. Mrs. White, I haven't got this quote up. She says, the angels will guide you to where you will should hide. And but this is telling us, Daniel is saying, everyone, everyone whose name is written in the book will be delivered. Please, know, it's not just some, most, you know, a, a good proportion. Everyone will be delivered. So when probation closes, you're making it through. You hear that? When the probation for the world closes. You are going to make it through to the second coming. <laughs> That's good news. That's good news. So, Revelation 13, verse 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, uh, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many 
as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Somebody break this down for me. The, well, the, who's this beast and the image of the beast and what is this talking about? The beast, image of the beast. The Catholic Church is the the beast. Yep. And this is when we see all the, we'll be watching all these political things which happen in between the United Nations and the World Economic Forum and the Bilderberg Group and, and all these other groups working together to give their power to the beast, which is the papacy, the papacy. And they'll make an image to the beast, which is an image honoring the beast, which is Sunday worship. And if you do not honor the beast by honoring his image, which is Sunday worship, they're going to say, you're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to die. So that's for the world and that's for people in general. That's when the death decree occurs. But for us as Adventists, it's slightly different. It's slightly different. We know that the Sunday law comes in is passed and when the Sunday law is passed initially it's rest on Sunday isn't it yes just cease your work just rest you know let's save the climate let's let's lower our carbon footprint or whatever they, whatever excuse they have more workers right whatever excuse okay let's just rest on Sunday okay that's how the Sunday law comes in okay it, it, it gets teeth later on but it comes in like that now we know that when the sunday law is initially passed which begin which starts the little time of trouble okay when the little time of trouble starts probation closes for the people of god so the probation in the world closes at the death decree the Probation for the people of God closes at the issuing of the Sunday law. First Peter four seventeen for the time is coming that judgment must begin at the house of God. Where does judgment begin? The house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not? The gospel of God. So present truth is that Jesus is about to leave the holies of holies. Holies of holies. That's present truth. The question is, how close are we to that? Now we can look at the other things that are happening, okay, which aren't necessarily present truth, because present truth is what God is going to do next, and, and get an indication of how close we are. Now, this indication isn't so that you can put off your preparation. This indication is to motivate you to continue your preparation. Okay? You, you're tracking with me. So, uh, there's a, there's a um, um, congresswoman... Um, uh, Lo Lauren Bobert. Bobert, okay. How do you pronounce it? Bobert. Bobert. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we know. <laughs> okay, Lauren Bobert, okay. And she says some interesting things about um, the separation of church and state. She says some interesting things. Um, we're going to play a video now, so I hope there's some audio on this one. Okay. I don't know what 
from there. I broke it. So in this video, which isn't playing, Lauren Boba is in church. And she is saying this. She is saying um, about the ch separation of church and state. She is saying um, the, the separation of church and state isn't doesn't mean what they say it means. It was written in a stinking letter. Her words. Her words. Don't shoot the messenger. Her words. It was written in a stinking letter and doesn't mean what they say it's me. What should be happening is that the the she's saying the government cannot control the church, but the church can control the government. She's an elected official for the United States, an elected official, and she has this thinking go in her head already. Now, um, she isn't the only one. I found about three other videos where people, elected officials, are already talking along this line. Three other officials who are already saying very similar things that there is going to be, that we need to change the separation of church and state. This happened in, the, this was reported in The Guardian. Alarm as U.S. Supreme Court takes a hatchet to church-state separation. The Guardian is a top-quality newspaper in England, so it's believable. A series of court decisions has raised fears that the conservative majority are forcing religion back into the U.S. political system. The court said to be more pro-religion than any at at than at any time since the 1950s, wrapped up one of its most consequential and divisive terms this week. Um, this was July the 22nd, this reported. Um, in May, um, th they passed that the, um, they could fly a Christian flag on the town hall in Boston. In June, they said that taxpayers' money could fund religious schools. Also in June, they said the football coach could pray during halftime on uh, the halfway line, 50-yard line, uh, during, his, uh, during his games. And then they got rid of Roe v. Wade. Roe v. Wade. This is chipping away at the um, separation of church and state. Unusually, the nine-member Supreme Court currently includes six Catholics, Chief Justice Robert Samuel Alito, Amy Coney, Bra Bar Co Coney Barrett, Brett Kavanaugh, and Clarence Tom Thomas, all appointed by Republican presidents, and Sonia Sotomayor, seated by a Democrat. Last year, the court ruled that a Catholic social services agency in Philadelphia could ignore city rules and refuse to work with same-sex couples who apply to take in foster children. Not thinking about the cases, but thinking about the separation of church and state. Why is that important to us as Adventists? And, and I'll, I just want to point out, at the brunch, I'll be showing the other videos that we have of, of other representatives talking about the abolition of church and state. Um, why is that important to us as Adventists? It's important for us as Adventists because the Sunday law cannot be passed unless the separation between church and state is eradicated. In some way, shape, or form, religious groups have to so influence government that they will be able to pass a law dictating how people should worship. And as strange and as radical as it seems, it's going to happen. This is part of the bill of the amendment, amendment the first amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Breaking that down, that's saying this, that the Congress cannot pass any law 
according to this amendment, which will set up a religion as a nation's religion. Okay? So even though people say um, America is a Christian nation, technically it's not. Technically it's not. The, the majority of people in this nation are Christian, but this is not necessarily a Christian nation according to the amendment. And it shouldn't prohibit anybody from, prohi um, from worshipping their God according to their conscience. According to their conscience. Mrs. White says this, The Bible teaches a separation of church and state, and therefore religious liberty for all. Earthly governments may not force the conscience or usurp the place reserved to God alone in the theocracy of Israel. Not until the second coming of Christ will God again establish his theocracy. Until then, men must not arrogate to themselves authority over the human conscience that God has not entrusted to them. And she goes on to say in Testimony Volume 1, when Protestantism shall stretch a hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp hands with spiritualism, when under the influence of this threefold union, our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republic, Republican government and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehood and delusions, then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and that the end is near. Mrs. White is saying it's going to happen. Question. Exactly. As I said before, in Europe, we had this union on both sides. We had the Church of England, a Protestant, a Protestant denomination, in league, in harmony with the government of England, persecuting Catholics. And on the other side, in Portugal, Spain, Italy, and these Catholic nations, you had the, the Roman Catholic Church in league with the governments persecuting Protestants. So either side, they were, there was persecution. And people left Europe to escape persecution and came to America. And that's why it was written into the Constitution, because they did not want this to occur again. And that is why they called it a wall, solid, that there'll be no, no influence of the church on the state or any influence of the state on the church that the two will remain separate. Mrs. White says this, Our land is in jeopardy. The time is drawing on when its legislators, like Lauren Bobert, shall so abjure the principles of Protestantism as to give countenance to Roman apostasy. The people for whom God has so marvelously wrought, strengthening them to throw off the galling yoke of popery, will by a national act give vigor to the corrupt faith of Rome, and thus arouse the tyranny which only waits for a touch to start again into cruelty and despotism. With rapid steps are we already approaching this period. With rapid steps, we are approaching this period. And, you know, the, she says Protestantism, and the devil is very smart. He, the Protestant churches don't call themselves Protestants anymore. They call themselves evangelicals. Evangelicals. So they're not even protesting against anything. They're not taking the torch that Martin and Wycliffe and Hearst and Jerome lit they're throwing down the torch and they're embracing Catholicism. So this 
is where we leave it for today. This is where we're going to leave it for today. There's more to talk about the present truth. We need to talk about its effect on God's people, the effect on the world, how it should be preached, and how it comes to an end. There's more to talk, and hopefully we will have another opportunity to continue this conversation next time. Next time. Um, I think I have one more slide. So, our decision is this. What we have to decide is this. Do we want truth or present truth? We have to insist upon present truth. Truth only lulls us to sleep. Truth only keeps us doing nothing. Present truth will awaken and get us ready. It is present truth that we need. And it's present truth that Satan is trying to keep from the church. Let us pray. Father God, we want to thank you there, Lord, for allowing us to talk about present truth. And there is a need for it. We need to know what we should be doing in the light of the fact that you will be leaving the holies of holies. That probation will end and we want to be on the right side when that occurs. We need to know what we should be doing now in our lives. So we pray the Lord that you will impress upon us present truth that we'll seek for it and search it out and take it in and allow it to change our lives. Father God, you are truth. Your Holy Spirit is truth. I pray there, Lord, that your truth, your spirit will descend upon us, transforming our hearts and minds, making us like Jesus, making us ready for translation. Because this is our prayer. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.